patience has a lot to do, mostly to do with you being patient with you. How many of you are good with that? Now, some of you guys, you are your own worst critic. You know you are. Joyce Myers said a few years ago, I'll never forget it. She said, if you talk to your friends or talked about your friends or to your friends the way that you talk about yourself, you wouldn't have any friends. Can you be a better friend to yourself? I'm not saying live in la-la land where you're, 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 you're just a train wreck messing things up and you're like, I'm blaming it on everybody else. No, 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 don't do that. Own your stuff, but stop allowing yourself to brutalize yourself. You need to get a better confession in your mouth. Say, I believe that he who began a good work in me is faithful to complete it. Yeah. Our, our God's a good God. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. God's going to finish that good work in me. You need to look at yourself in the mirror every morning. Not every morning, but most mornings. Look at yourself in the mirror and say, hey, overcomer. Hey, champion. Hey, victorious warrior. Hey, peculiar person. Whatever. Compliment yourself a little bit more than you do. It's all past. You're trying to puff us up, make us get all, get all, get all excited and hyped up about ourselves. <laughs> Why not? The enemy's beating you up all the time. Somebody needs to encourage you. I'm going to encourage you. The devil's trying to wipe you out. I'm trying to lift you up. Can you, can you learn how to receive a compliment? Well, listen, when somebody compliments you, just say, oh, no, don't say that. Don't stop that. Just stop that in Jesus' name. Somebody gives you a compliment, say thank you. Oh, you see that? Oh, I might not see that, but I appreciate you seeing something good in me. And they say something else, go, well, thank you for that too. What else you got? <laughs> don't you know there's people talking bad about you sometimes? And don't you, have you ever said it in your life? Man, I wish people would just be quiet about me, leave me alone. Well, sometimes you need to hear somebody say something good about you. So I'm that guy today. I want to say something good about you. You're in the right place at the right time. And God's got the right blessing for you today. You know, I just, I just can't let it go. I saw a little video the other day, and I can't get past it. You know, I just see so many people in the world today, everybody's into everybody else's business. Did that irritate you? It has nothing to do with them. Somebody cutting their grass, just leaving it a little too long or a little too short. And they say, hey, why don't you go, why don't you adjust your lawnmower a little bit so it won't be so high or be too short? You know, why don't you, why don't you, why? And, and then I saw this video. I thought, man, it's perfect. I wish we could just coin this, put it on a Bitcoin or put it on, put it on currency or put it on T-shirts or bumper stickers. We need to put it on a billboard. It's a little bitty girl. She's like between two and three years old. She's in the back seat. She's got some little thing she's playing with. I don't know if it was a phone or just something. She had it in her hands. And I think her dad was driving the, driving the minivan, but the camera was on the little kid. And she says, uh, he, the, the dad said uh, something about what she needed to do while she's sitting in her car seat back there just minding her business. And uh, dad's saying something to her, and she says uh, uh, to, the, to the baby, and the baby said, you mind your own business. You mind yourself. Just as sweet as could be. You mind yourself. You mind, you mind yourself. You mind yourself. I thought that is so sweet. <laughs> Can we just learn how to do that a little bit? We don't have to get all fed up and, oh, get out of my business. What can't you say? You know, I actually said that because we're in the middle of uh, doing a um, repainting and some freshening up of our house right now. And so there's things that Amy wants to help me with. Um, that I didn't ask her for, I didn't ask for her help. <laughs> and, uh, or I'm trying to help her and she didn't ask me for help. And so, so I just thought, you know what? I don't have to be mean when I, when I, when I tell her to mind her business. I said, you mind yourself. You just mind yourself. <laughs> but you know what? I, I just believe that God is true to his word. That he is going to finish the good work he started in us. He is. And he is patient with you. He has a long suffering with you. The way your attitude towards other people, he does. He is, he's such a good God. Aren't you glad we serve a patient God? Yes. You, may, you, you like strike three, you're out. No, no, he's got a few more. 
But just know this, sometimes if you don't come by grace, you will, you will come by the road. He will, he will allow things and situations to get turned up a little bit where you have to run to him, and that's okay. Sometimes we need that. But we need to understand this in the midst of being, there is where we are, and there is where God wants us to be. And there's this place between here and there. There's a place called somewhere. And man, sometimes that's frustrating. Am I the only one? I wish I, I wish that breakthrough would happen. I wish this would. I wish that was. I wish she was. I wish he was. I wish they were. I wish we were. Between here and there is a place called somewhere. And if we're not careful, we can be our own worst enemy. But if we handle it right we can also be our own best encourager. Like Kim Clement said years ago, he says, I'm somewhere in the future, and I look much better than I look right now. <laughs> Come on, just keep on keeping on. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Here's my title. Be patient, because there is a time for everything. It's not here yet. For some of us, it's because it's not time. God's still working on some things. Sometimes it's not here yet because we're dragging our feet. We don't always know which one it is. But we've got to have a good attitude regardless of that. Too many Christians, I was like, I need, I need a picture that is going to describe where many Christians are today and the attitude in which they are. Too many Christians are like Violet. Now, y'all know who Violet is? Put Violet up there. I want y'all to see Violet. That's Viola from the Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory. Oh, I guess it was back in the late 60s, early 70s. See, Willy Wonka had a chocolate factory. And Willy Wonka was going to retire, but nobody knew he was getting ready to retire. He said, I want to find my successor. And they have to have the right attitude. They have the right heart. Didn't tell nobody. But what he did is he had these really nice candy bars that everybody liked. And inside the candy bar wrapper, he put a golden ticket. Whoever got the golden ticket candy bar were to take it to the factory, this crazy, awesome factory where they made all kinds of candy and stuff. And uh, you bring the ticket. And so there were seven kids that got golden tickets. And they show up, and they were going through these different phases, of seeing the different places in the factory. And people were in the middle of getting a test from Willy Wonka, and they didn't know it. How many of you know that you're actually going through a few tests right now that God's putting you through, and you don't even realize it? We're wondering a little bit sometimes about why promotion doesn't come. My Bible tells me promotion comes from the Lord. Maybe it's a divine delay. Maybe it's a dummy delay. Maybe you still got a few hard knocks you got to go. You got to learn something before God takes you to the next level. But old Violet. Violet was a young lady that uh, had a rich father that gave her everything she wanted. And Violet was a whole lot impatient. She would always say this to her dad, and dad would get her everything immediately. Dad, I want it. And I want it now. Well, well, honey, I'd like to get that for you, but but I, I we're not we can't we're here right now. But I want it now. I want it, and I want it now. Well, they were in this one part of the factory where there is a they they were working on the mill pill. Do y'all remember this? The mill pill is a little pill, and you eat the little mill pill, and and it tastes like. Oh, here's the, chi here's the chicken. Oh, here's the green beans. Oh, here's this and here's that. And, and so they were talking about all this stuff and said something about dessert. And Violet, she likes dessert. And so she, she says, I want it. Well, you can't. I can't. Want, it, want it now. She grabs one of the pills from one of the little, what are they called, Oompa Loompas. And she throws it in her mouth and she starts saying, mm, 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 dried fried chicken. Ooh, I love fried chicken. Ooh, mashed potatoes. I love the taste of the mashed potatoes. And there's Willie standing off to the side. He's like, oh, no, this is bad. It's not going to turn out good. 
You know, he's just standing there. He know. Do, do you know this? Just know this. God knows what's right around the corner with the consequences of the impatient decisions that you make. And I think sometimes he's saying, oh, no, this isn't going to work out well. But the one thing God never does is take away your choice. Right. Thank God we have people praying for us. Amen. Yeah. And so, so she's talking about mashed potatoes. She's talking about green beans. And all of a sudden she's like, oh. Oh, what's that? Oh, it's the dessert. It tastes like blueberries. And he goes, oh, no, it's about to get bad. And all of a sudden, they go, what's happening? And so she all of a sudden blows up. Like, I mean, she gets real big. Oh, what's going on? Well, we haven't. That's the reason why we said don't eat it yet, because we haven't worked out all the bugs with this thing, and we have a problem with the dessert. Of course, she swelled up, and they thought, oh, no, she's going to blow up and mess the factory up. So they ushered her out of the factory. And she got disqualified from being the recipient of being the factory owner. I want you to know, sometimes we think the little things we do in life don't matter. They matter more than we think they do. You know, we wonder why this breakthrough isn't coming our way. Maybe we're disqualifying ourselves. Maybe it's just not time. See, that the fruit of the Spirit of God is patience. And too many of us are just like Violet. I want it, and I want it now. You know, I want to take it out of the abstract, and I want to get into very a personal place. Not too personal, but, you know, in the area of relationships. When we're thinking about who we're going to marry. You married folks, we got some of this stuff figured out, but not all of it. Some of us, because of our previous impatience, were paying the cost of it. We, God, God designed marriage to be that place that when you are in a covenant marriage between a man and a wife, when they make those marriage vows, then, then intimacy enters the marriage. But unfortunately, today, in the culture that we live in, in the spirit of this world, we get, what's it called in Texas, we say, we get the, the cart before the horse. And so the, the glue that holds the relationship together is emotions and um, flesh appetites instead of being able to pray and communicate the 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 um the glue of honor the glue of respect the gr the glue of kindness and the rest of the fruit of the spirit and then when change comes how many of you know change comes to every person you're not the same person at 60 that you were at 30 you're definitely not the same one at 18 there's hormonal changes. I love what Bishop Jake said many years ago. He talked about the concept of liquid love. The way that Amy and I interact now is different than the way we interacted when we were in our 20s and 30s. It's a totally different deal. I want you to know that when we get impatient in our relationships, it costs us. God knows what he's doing, amen? Amen. And it's not just intimate, it's not husband and wife or just relationships. It's also in promotions, in our careers, in our, bu in our businesses. We, get, we, we suffer from this, this uh, environment, this mindset of comparison. Oh, my business is doing better than their business. Oh, this church is doing better than that church. Oh, oh this, this activity is better than that activity. And we wonder why it's not working. Well, I just want to go back to mind yourself. Stop, you're not going to be good at what you do when you're focusing what somebody else is doing. You just stick down to, to, to your thing and just do it the best you can. And if it's not working out and you think you're doing your best, then ask God. Matthew 7, 7, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be opened. God wants to give you wisdom. And I want to encourage you in this too. Man, Choose good friends. Get good people on your team that will not just blow some smoke and just tell you what you want to hear. On the other side, make sure you don't just have a bunch of negative Nancys on your team that you ask them their opinion. What, what, what do you think about this endeavor that I'm in, the season that I'm in right now? You got any insight how, how you know, maybe, maybe you could help pray for me or get me on the other side of this 
of this, uh, this mountain that I'm climbing, and there all they have is a negative word? Oh, no, we need, we need people that are going to really shoot straight with us. I think there's way too many people that are like the king with, with uh, new clothes. Y'all remember the, the nursery rhyme, the king with new clothes? I don't even know why that's in a little kid's book. That's kind of crazy. So, yeah, how many, anybody here not heard the story of the king with new clothes? Oh, okay, well, you're going to like this. Watch this. The king, he always liked the latest and greatest everything. And so he's in his palace. He's got all the stuff. And, and so this con artist shows up at the palace. And uh, he sees how the king likes all the new, latest, and greatest stuff. He said, hey, king, I have this magic thread. And if I weave this magic garment for you, you're going to have the greatest fashion, latest, and greatest attire. No one has anything like it. Why? Because it's made out of this magic thread. Where is it? He goes, I'm holding it right here. It's invisible, king. This stuff is awesome. You need me to make you a garment out of that. He says, okay, cool. Make me something. Well, he don't have nothing, but he makes the king act like he's, oh, yeah, oh, this is looking beautiful. This is perfect. Oh, uh, final finishing touches. Put it on, king. He goes, where is it at? Well, let me put it on for puts it, Okay, puts, the, puts it on him. He goes, all right, come on out and show everybody. The king thinks he's wearing a magic garment. No, king's naked. He's like, hey, the king, what you got? And he's just like, hey, how y'all like my new outfit? Don't this look great? Woo, I'm looking nice. I'm looking nice. This fit fits perfect, man. This feels, this feels like I'm wearing nothing at all. <laughs> and like the people in the palace are like, people in the palace are like, oh, man, don't say nothing. You know, he, he does not like criticism. You probably get executed. You say anything about it. It's just like his favorite clothes. Walking down the street, and he's like, hey, you like my new garment? They're like, sure, king, whatever. That looks great. Everybody in the kingdom is like, man, king's lost his mind. We're probably going to have to find somebody else to be king because he done lost it. That guy, I hope, I hope he got a lot of money, and I hope he's out of town because when the king finds out, he's going to be in trouble. Well, all of a sudden, the king, he's, he's full of himself at this point because nobody disagrees that the king is really looking good. And so all of a sudden he walks down the street and there's this little boy. And he asks the little boy, he says, hey, son, you like my new garments? The little boy, huh? <laughs> you, like, you like my new outfit? Goes, What's wrong? What do you, you, don't, you don't like it? He goes, king, you're naked. <laughs> Wait a minute. Everybody else, I don't care what everybody else says, king. Listen, I don't, listen, all I know one thing is you're the king, oh, two things, and you're naked. The king got so mad. I wonder how many people have people in their life when they're, we're in this season of, of impatience where we're, we're asking our friends, you know, don't ask your enemy, but ask your friends, hey, what do I need to do? And your friends say, oh, you need to do, no, do nothing. You're just perfect. No, no. We need people that will give us love and truth at the same time. That's how we help people. Come on, y'all. Let's be a good friend. And we have impatience in ministry. I just want to just say this. God is a God of abundance and not scarcity. And there is a ministry for you. I believe there's a ministry for, ministry for you in any church and every church. Where, where we get in trouble is we look at, look at ministry from a position of scarcity instead of abundance. And we, we look like a bunch of billy goats playing king of the mountain. You're saying something bad about someone else or, or moving them out of the way. No, no, no. We need to love people. You want promotion to come to you? You, you, want, you want to pass the test that God's given you? Start making room for other people. Start encouraging other people. Start praying for other people. God will make a, make a way for you. You'll find out sometimes I've been in, well, yeah, pretty much. No, I haven't been in ladies' ministry. I've been in every ministry in the church. And you know, there were great seasons. And there were other seasons where I thought, there's no way I'm going to be able to do this. But yet God let me do that. There were seasons I, I went along and said, yeah, I'll do that too. And then, and then like somebody came along and said, no, I'd really like to do that. And be like, oh, thank God somebody took that. So <laughs> We need to get in that place where, where we see God as a God of abundance, not scarcity, in relationships, in business, in ministry, in our health and healing. Stop taking the bait of the quick fix, which comes because of impatience. Yeah. 
You know, all these people walking around in the gym. You know, we got, there's all kinds of different gyms, but you walk in the gym and, you know, you never see this guy in the gym working out, but he's got these big old veins. He's all lifting 500 pounds, but yeah, eating fried chicken and, and, uh, and just not putting the good stuff in his body. Like, how'd you get so big? Oh, that's because I work so hard because I do so good. No, because he's injecting himself with steroids. Too many young people dying because they're impatient. It feels good to be able to go to the gym and eat your mashed, not mashed potatoes, they're not good for you. Eat your steak and your, and, your, and your broccoli and your protein shake and you just work out and you feel good. And at the end of the day, when you, when you look in the mirror and you're proud of yourself, you can say this one thing, I didn't cheat. Man, whether it's in the gym or whether it's in a relationship or business or your walk with God or ministry, man, don't cheat. Just, just, just keep doing good. Don't grow weary in well-doing because you'll reap a harvest if you don't faint in so many areas of your life. Come on, church. Give God praise. So listen, we, have the, we don't have it now, so we act in the flesh and go after those quick fix. But just know this. Remember this. We serve a God who sees it all. I'm not coming from a place of, of God's going to get you or judgment. No, it's not what I'm saying at all. We serve a God who loves you and, and, and hears you and sees you. And it's a God of compassion. God doesn't like it when you're hurting. God doesn't, God doesn't like it when you're lonely. God doesn't like it when you're frustrated with something, when you're doing your best and the breakthrough isn't coming. God doesn't like that. He wants you to, to, to enjoy. See, the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, which is rules and regulations. No, the kingdom of God is righteousness, right standing with him, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. He wants to bless every part of your life. We'll get it quicker if we learn how to walk in the fruit of patience. I want to give this to you. God sees it all. And this is how he wants us to respond. Psalms 37, 1. He says, do not fret because of evildoers. Don't be envious towards wrongdoers. He says, mind yourself. For they will wither quickly like the grass and fade like the green herb. Trust in the Lord. Amen. So we got five people that are going to trust the Lord. Let me say it again. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. God, you've called me to, you've equipped me for, and I'm on my assignment, and I'm going to be faithful to it. Let me just say, listen, you want promotion? You want favor? You want increase in abundance? Let me just tell you, whether it's church, whether it's in a relationship, a job, a ministry, can I just encourage Get there on time. When you get there, before you get there, have a good attitude. Do your best. Prefer other people. If there's an opportunity to help somebody while you're doing your thing too, man, help them. Be a blessing. Be that person when you walk in the door and people see you, they go, yes, she's here. He's here. Awesome. My team is going to be rocking this Sunday. Oh, man, our, our team is going to do fantastic instead of the other way. Oh, no, they're here. Let's go. <laughs> Quick. We don't want that. We, we, are in, we are in charge of what that looks like for the most part. Some of it, people just hate you. I'm just telling you. If you, you, you can't control that. Let's control what we can control. He says, don't fret because of them, for, for they will. Oh, cultivate faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him. And look at what it says. And he will do it. Yeah. If you know he's called you to it, he's going to equip you for it, and he's going to give you all the tools. He's going to give you all the favor, all the anointing, all the connection. Somebody give God praise. He's going to do it. With this whole patience, let me give it to you. It's going to happen in due time. Ecclesiastes 3, it says, a time for everything. There is an appointed time for everything. And there's a time for every event under heaven. A time to give birth and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot what is planted. 
A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. Think of some of these things. A time to throw stones and a time to gather stones. A time to embrace and a time to shun embracing. A time to search and a time to give up is lost. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear apart and a time to sow. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. What profit is there to the worker from that in which he toils? The writer says, I've seen the task which God has given the sons of men with which to occupy themselves. God set eternity in the heart of man. He has made everything appropriate in its time. He's also set eternity in their heart, yet so that man will not find out the work which God has done from the beginning even to the end. What he's saying here is, God knows it all. God has an order. God has a plan. You want promotion. God sometimes won't allow it until you pass the test, and then you get the promotion. He knows it all. He said, and finally, he says, I know that there's nothing better for them than to rejoice and do good in one's lifetime. Know this, you may not know what time it is, but God does. Just be faithful in the moment that you're in right now. But I want it now. Show her to, show, show her to me again. You may not look like that on the outside, but there's a lot of people looking like that on the inside. Got to have it. Got to have it right now. But yet you got all kind of character issues. You got integrity issues. You're still dealing with the pain and the drama of the last thing. And now you're trying to find the new thing, thinking that the new thing is going to fix the pain of the old thing. No, 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 no. Sometimes God needs to heal that first. I want it now. You think God doesn't know that you want that? God knows everything. So why does it seem that there is a delay? Why the delay? You know, could it be that it really is your flesh? You got to get this and this right before God brings it to you. Anybody ever live that one? Yeah. So maybe not your flesh. Maybe, what if it's God? What if it's God just sovereignly saying, I can't bring you into that season because there's someone that's occupying that space right now. And not that I'm going to kill this person or going to obliterate, obliterate or mess up this person. They have to move out of that seat in order for you to be in that seat. How God, God can, he knows it all. That just messes with us to think that God doesn't, God knows it all. And maybe... That God is bringing about a divine delay for you about something that you know nothing about. Maybe there's some development, some growth that needs to happen. You know, David was a different person from the time he was anointed king than when he actually became king. He was a stinky shepherd boy. He killed a few lions, he killed a few bears, he killed a giant. He was a mighty warrior. He was a psalmist. He was an intercessor. He was a, he was a very good uh, political, um, relational negotiator. The king that was in the seat tried to throw a spear, tried, tried to spear him through twice. When David became king, he was ready to be king. But it took a few years to get there. There was a divine delay. Joseph was a different person from the time he had the dream and its fulfillment in Egypt. Joseph, although he was the interpreter of dreams and God blessed him, do you know Joseph had some character flaws? Remember that coat of many colors? He was the only son that got one and he sure let everybody know that. 
Hey, boys, y'all like my coat? It's pretty, isn't it? There's not another one like it on the whole planet. My daddy had this made for me. All you brothers, do you have? Oh, you don't have one. Maybe he ran out of thread. Maybe he just made me one because he liked me and he didn't like you. It shows my daddy's favor. He, he did. He would, listen, I'm not trying to throw rocks. I'm just telling you Bible. He, I didn't say he, I don't know why there was only one coat. I'm just saying, but he, he flaunted. And Joseph was a messy tattletale. Do you know that? He'd go out and he'd find out what the brothers were doing. Hey, dad, I know you told them to, but you know what else they did? Every time Joseph would show up, there'd be something. And he had a couple of dreams. One about his family bowing down to him. Other, another dream about you know, later on. And, and here's what happened. There was, there was this moment when the brothers had enough and threw him in the pit. They wanted to kill him. And the oldest brother said, no, 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 no. We're not going to kill him. We're going to figure out what we're going to do. And so while the oldest brother was gone, there was a caravan that went by that uh, were like, like a traveling caravan merchant caravan and they sold him into slavery and he ended up in Egypt and little by little God was chipping off that arrogance that that uh, those things that didn't look like the nature and character of God was getting chipped off of him and it, through a false accusation through imprisonment and just for feeling feeling like he was uh, lied to and lied about and and people didn't keep their promises and and, uh, and and at the end of it all before he goes before Pharaoh he doesn't claim any of the any of the glory any of the victory any of the intellect when he interprets Pharaoh's dream he says I can't do it, but the God I serve can. Let's see what God can do. I tell you what, that's a problem with a lot of us in church or a lot of us as Christians is we want the glory, but we should never get the glory. He always gets the glory. He always gets the glory. It gets so much easier when he gets it all and we just get to be a part of what he's doing in the planet today. What's happening in the waiting in the divine delay, I can tell you what I hope is happening. Maturity, spiritual maturity, character development, experience, conviction. Conviction is different than condemnation. Did you know that? Condemnation pushes you away from God. Conviction pushes you to God. We need to get in that place where, where we have that conviction, where we know God was with us, God is with us, He will be with us. But until then, with impatience, we say, I will show it to her again. But I want it, and I want it now. You know, when we rush things, we can mess everything up. We can mess everything up when we rush it. I want to give you three things in nature that will mess it up if we rush it. The chicken and the egg. I had a friend that used to raise these beautiful chickens. I know that's strange, but true. He would raise these beautiful, and we had incubators, and these eggs would be in this incubator. I think it was 28 days. And so the first few times we had these, these eggs in the incubator, um, We'd pull it out, and we'd try to help the chicken. We'd pull on the, on the egg a little bit. If, if you ever get into chicken raising, please don't do that. Because what you do is you will change the atmosphere inside of the egg, and the chicken will, baby chicken will die when you rush it. I don't know if you have spiritual ears. Do you listen to what I'm saying? When you rush the things that God has for you, you are jacking with the atmosphere. You're messing with things out of its timing. Let God have his way. Let that chicken, it's actually getting stronger as it's pecking its way out. A caterpillar in its chrysalis, in that cocoon before it becomes a butterfly. Don't help it. Do you know you will kill the butterfly if you try to help get it out of its cocoon? Why? Because as it's breaking through, it's gaining strength in its wings so it can fly when it finally gets out. The last one is a bird in a nest before its wings are developed. The worst thing you can do is go get that little bird and when it's got the little Baby birds are ugly. 
you know, they're pink and big old beak and little feathers sticking out. And they're in, they're in the nest and mama comes by and gives them a little snack. We're not even going to talk about that. And, and so they're in the nest and they're always hungry and they're flapping, but there's no feather on their wings. How, how wrong would it be? You go, oh, well, birdie, you're a bird. So obviously, bird, you're ready to fly. Come on, it's, today's the day you're going to fly. And you throw it up out of the nest, it's going to die. You got to let things happen in the time in which they're supposed to happen. Things need to develop before you can fly. There's things that we need to break out of and break off of us before we're ever going to be that spiritual butterfly. Rushing into action before it's time can bring unnecessary hurt and pain. There's a verse in the Bible, and I'm going to close with this. It reminds me of my early days in ministry. It's, the, it's this year that we're in. I've been doing this 21 years in the senior pastor chair and 14 years of studying under my pastor in youth ministry and so many different things. Y'all realize it's 35 years in the same house. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't ask for that, but I just told you that I'm old. <laughs> but I've learned a few things along the way, especially in early youth ministry days and some other opportunities of ministry here. And, and I learned that people can sometimes try to incite you when uh, we used to have these certain cultures and rules, but more, more, more legalism than anything about uh, you got to wear, a, you, you know, um, you don't wear ball caps and man, people with tattoos are probably a drug dealer and, you know, ladies skirts are too short. They're probably a lady of the evening or, you know, just but people say all kinds of crazy stuff and, you know, pastor, you tell them don't wear that and fix that and they, they don't smell right. They don't look right. They're not walking right. No, no, no. And so my early days is I would go try to fix it. And what did I end up doing? I told people, you don't belong here. How much, how much you think God really appreciated us doing that? I stopped listening to mean religious people. And I started listening more and more to the Holy Spirit. I'm telling you what, we just, we, we got to get in that place. Or There's a couple of... Um, before we called it small groups, there was a, kind of like a, a couple of different groups. I had gatherings, and there were some things happening in a couple of the small groups. And there was we could catch word back on some stuff. And, and so, Pastor, you got to shut that down. You got to fix that. You got to do this. You got to do that. And you know, got to take care of that. Because and uh, didn't didn't know anything about exactly what was going on. But but boy, I sure thought I need to go fix that. And I went over there, and guess what happened? And I heard a bunch of people. They thought, they thought I was uh, making a false accusation against them and hurt those people. And, you know, several of those people are still with us today, but many of those people may not even be serving God today. You know, I just wonder if maybe when I stand before him at his judgment seat, I wonder what he's going to say to me about how I treated people. I'm thankful for his mercy and grace, but I might get a few spankings on judgment day. I don't, I don't want that. And so I just thought, you know, I want to be in that place where, where, where I am a kingdom of God person, I'm a loving person, I'm a grace person, I'm a good pastor, I'm a good shepherd, and, and I'm not going to rush. I'm not going to rush the development of anyone else. I'm not going to rush the development of me. And I just want to be in that place where, where it, it's a daily step-by-step step checking in and letting God just that whole uh, breathing in and breathing out that intimacy with God where, where we're doing what he wants us to do. Not just me, but all of us together being the body of Christ. And don't, don't, listen, don't rush it. Just let things unfold. Matt, here it is. This is the one that, fit, this, this scripture fixed me from that. Matthew 13, 24. Jesus had a parable and he said, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed seed in his field. But while he was sleeping, while, the, while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and they went away. But when the wheat sprouted and bore grain, then the tares became evident also. And the slaves of the land, landowner came to him and said, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, An enemy's done this. And the slaves said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No. 
For while you're gathering up the tares, you may uproot the wheat with them. Allow, listen, look at this wisdom. Allow both to grow together until the harvest, and then the fi- in the time of the harvest, I'll say to the reapers, first gather up the tares, bind them in bur- bundles to burn them up, but gather the wheat into my barn. Verse 36. Then he left the crowd and went into his house. And his disciples came and said to him, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. Jesus said, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man, and the field is the world. And as for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom, and the tares are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil, and the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Watch this. So just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send forth His angels, and they will gather out of His kingdom all the... Look, you you think you're going to try to fix some? We need to let God fix some stuff. He says they will gather them out of of His kingdom, all the stumbling blocks, and all who commit lawlessness. Pause. What's the greatest commandment, Jesus? Jesus. He said, oh, this is so simple. The great first and greatest to, in, in the law is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. The second, which is almost important, love your neighbor as yourself. And if you can do that, you fulfill everything that the prophets and the law are talking about. He's taking care and getting rid of anything that has to do with lawlessness, which has a lot to do with how we love people. He said, I'll throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place, they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. But the righteous, everybody say, but the righteous. The righteous will shine forth as a sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. I just want you to know this. And Arnold Feld, my, my prayer buddy, man, thank you. Eight years together, we've read the book of the Bible the, all the way through for eight years, nonstop, eating all the broccoli verses and everything. Give it up for Arnold, my buddy. Love you talking about the wheat and the tares he says pastor do you know how you can tell the difference between wheat and tares show that show that picture please the difference between wheat and tares and this is how you'll know during harvest time which is which wheat has an abundance of harvest on it do you see that the tear is sterile it has nothing at harvest time show the other picture please at harvest time the, the harvest is so heavy at the end of the stalk, it bends over. It bows down. The tear, because it has no fruit on it, it, it sticks out like a sore thumb. And what God says is, put some time on it. The kids of the kingdom are going to have that posture of humility and humbleness and of of unity the tears i'm gonna do my thing i'm gonna have my way and it's all about me it's all about me that tear just sticking up just like that i want you to know god is real serious about his love for his church and the love for his church growing up Things are going to be real apparent during harvest time in relationships, in ministry, in career, in healing. Will you stand to your feet this morning? I want you to see this field right here. What God wants for you in your life is God wants there to be an abundant harvest regarding the seeds that you've planted and the life that you've lived. He wants your relationships to be full of the things of God. He wants your family, your ministry, your children to be blessed, to have good fruit hanging on your tree. He wants your businesses to prosper, where when your customers interact with you, they're not just buying a product or a service. They're going to know that they had an encounter with a man or a woman of God that met a need or service in their life. And River of Praise... And I, my prayers for every church is that more and more and more we would make it less about us and more about Him and bear the fruit of a harvest 
that's all about him. Amen? Come on, somebody give God praise. I want to pray. I want to pray with you real quick. See, I know. See, I said it earlier. God sees you, and he knows that many of you are hurting in this place of impatience, whether it's a divine delay or a dummy delay. Some of it's our own doing. Some of it, God is honestly causing there to be a pause because something else may be there in the way or something that needs to be developed in you. Don't grow weary. God wants to finish that. But you know how it all gets better real quick? It's first we know we're in right standing with Him. The one thing God wants more than anything else is He wants a relationship with His kids. All of us. He created all of us. And He made it real easy. The sin, sin separates us from God. But God sent His only Son, Jesus, to die on the cross to pay the final payment for all of our sin and separation. And Paul said it the most beautiful way, that we can run boldly before the throne of grace and find help in time of need. Instead of, instead of whitewashing it over and saying, I don't need any help. We need to learn how to say, Jesus, help me. Jesus, I'm running to you. Hey, that, they need to write a song called Fix Me, Jesus. They, if, if they don't have one, they need one. Fix me, Jesus. Fix me, Jesus. Because we, yeah, we need him. So come on, let's be honest. Take our hands like this. I want God to just hit us right square in the middle of the bullseye regarding patience. Say this with me, Lord Jesus. You know where I'm at today. And I ask you to heal me in the area of patience. Lead me. Teach me. Open up my ears. If there's something you want to show me that I need to do, I need your instruction. And come into my heart. Be my Lord and Savior and the forgiver of all my sins. Teacher, lover of my soul, I give you my life for the rest of eternity. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, come on, give him praise. Thanks again for watching River of Praise. We hope that we inspired you, encouraged you. And if we did, would you please share this video with your friends and family? Also, if you'd like to support River of Praise, there's a link on the bottom of the screen you can click to give. Thanks again for watching.